This um, visit today uh, comes out of my class, which, uh, which meets at this time, and uh, I want to welcome all of the students from this little sem seminar that we have called The Corporate Self, where we are examining the blurring of the boundaries between humans and corporations. So we are looking at everything from the way human beings have been branded as property in the construction of this country to the way in which people increasingly are told that they have to be their own little corporation in order to be successful in the world, be their own brand. Um, and also at the ways in which that kind of public performance of the self is now merging with a prevalent um, and extremely lucrative business model that is increasingly being called surveillance capital where our most intimate and, um, a, a, and personal expressions and relationships are the raw input for a uh, business model that is selling all of this data about ourselves and creating some of the richest people, or actually indeed the richest people in the history of money. Um, so as part of that chapter of the course, um, we read uh, a chapter from Leanne Simpson, as we have always done. And um, Leanne Simpson's work really has been some of the most provocative that we have read about the impact of, um, of, this, of this sort of predatory, extractive uh, um, business model on social movements and the formation of the self. Um, so I'm just delighted to, to welcome Leanne Simpson here. Uh, Leanne is a Anishinaabe and a member of the Arnold of Alderville First Nation in what is now called Ontario, Canada. She is one of these people who is just um, maddeningly multi-talented, I have to tell you, um, because in addition to being this extraordinary public scholar, and that's the capacity in which you are going to hear from Leanne today, you won't be able to miss the fact that she is also an amazingly beautiful writer. She is a poet, a spoken word artist, and on top of that, an amazing musician and performer. Um, so for those of you who haven't uh, researched uh, her body of work, please do. Um, I've learned so much from her over the years. <clears throat> Dr. Simpson is a, a faculty member of uh, the Deshinta Center for Research and Learning and a distinguished visiting professor in the Faculty of Arts at Ryerson University. She's written and co-edited a shelf's worth of books, several of them award-winning, including Dancing on Our Turtle's Back, The Gift is in the Making, Lighting the Eighth Fire, This is an Honor Song, and The Winter We Danced. Her most recent books are As We Have Always Done, Indigenous Freedom Through Radical Resistance, and This Accident of Being Lost. On the jacket of one of those books, there's a quote from me saying, I have learned more from this battered world from reading Leanne Simpson than from almost any writer alive today. None of that's really true. She's currently on her way to a conference at Princeton on settler colonialism and was kind enough to agree to stop by to visit um, Rutgers today. Um, we got this larger room because we knew that there would be broader interest in hearing from her. Leanne's going to present for about 20 minutes um, and then I'm going to have the pleasure of being in conversation with her. And then at the end, before we wrap up, we'll open it up to questions from all of you. So please join me in welcoming the answers. has always been Lowland, 
And the way that I've talked about that in As We Have Always Done has been by using the term resurgence. So I was thinking in preparation for this what resurgence means to me on a daily basis. And for me, I think of it as a ongoing reciprocal interaction with my ancestors, with those not yet born, with the plants and animal nations, with the waterways, with the neighboring indigenous nations, and with the anti-colonial peoples of the world and their worlds. I am Michi Sagik Anishinaabek, or Ojibwe, and our territory is the North Shore of Lake Ontario. My particular understanding of resurgence comes from this part of the world. It comes from a Machisa Geek and Ishnabek practice of life, living in deep relationality with the land, the waters, the plants, the animals, and the peoples of Kinagachi and Ishnabek Ogaming, the place where we all live and work together. It comes from Nayano Nibimong Gichigaming the Great Lakes, carrying and cycling water from Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Ontario. It comes from the maple sugar bushes carrying and filtering water from the soil, combining it with light and converting it into sweet sugar. It comes from lake shores full of minoman or wild rice, gathering strength in mid-July and moving from floating to standing. It comes from the black bears that wake up in Mukwa Gizis or February, turn around in their dens on beds of blueberry branches, and then settle back into fasting and dreaming for a few more weeks. This land, this particular land, has taught me that resurgence is a continual, reflective, reciprocal, and often critical interaction with my ancestors. It is a persistent world building process. Despite the, comp the constant imposition of the colonial machinery of elimination. This is not what the literature says about resurgence. It isn't what Google says about resurgence, primarily because Resurgence is not something that you can learn about by studying it, by doing research, by reading about it, or by Googling it. Resurgence is in no way a response to colonialism. It is a procedure for indigenous life and indigenous living that indigenous people used long before our existence depended upon our ability to resist and survive the violence of capitalism heteropatriarchy, and expansive dispossession. My ancestors woke up each morning and they built Anishinaabe life. They built their collective philosophical and ethical understandings. They made processes for solving conflict and reestablishing balance. They built their economy with the consent of plant and animal nations they shared land with. They built and maintained and nurtured systems for sharing knowledge and taking care of each other. And they worked collectively to replicate, reproduce, amplify, and share Anishinaabe life. Because if they did not, it wouldn't exist. They were not consumers, they were producers. They were makers. They got up and they worked hard, not the white man, nine to five, Monday to Friday kind of work that we inevitably have to engage in. Not the kind of work where you outsource labor so you can do something more important, but the kind of work that values and finds meaning in the way one lives. They got up and worked hard all day to build a world. This algorithm of living, theory, praxis, seemingly intertwined and relationally responsive to each other is generated through relations with Machisagi Kinishnabek land, land that is constructed and defined by our intimate spiritual, emotional, and physical relationship to it. 
living as a creative act. Self-determination, consent, kindness, and freedom at its core, replicated over and over. Making as the material basis for experiencing and influencing the world, living with the purpose of generating continual life. Our infrastructure for life was relationships, not, not institutions. Our orientation for life was internationalist. We shared space and time with plant and animal nations, with different indigenous nations, mostly without the use of enclosures and violence. We did not have a secret bank account of dead mus musuk to protect us against hard times. We had healthy reciprocal relationships with other plant and animal nations, other human families, and neighboring indigenous nations, and in times of trouble, we relied on these relationships of care to get us through. In thinking about my presence here at Rutgers and my presence later at Princeton, I started to think about how my ancestors would have got here from the Gojuani, from Peterborough, Ontario. The preparations and planning would have had to begin a year in advance because I would have had to build a canoe. And because I don't know how to do this, I would have had to call Omama Nininuk, Robert Kamanda from Gidigan Zibi, and engage in some international diplomacy and ask for help. I would have to harvest the birch bark in Nokomet. That's that first part of spring when <coughs> the, uh, the tree frogs start to sing and when the broad leaves are born. There's enough humidity in the air on those days that the bark will kind of pop off the trees. I would need to harvest the materials of four other trees in addition to Wigwas. I would need Zisagandawabek, zis spruce roots, Gijgatik, cedar, Mananons, ironwood, and Bapa Gamik, ash. I would need to obtain consent from each of these beings to harvest them, and so I would need sema, or tobacco, from four different plants that I had harvested and died last summer. Some of these materials are no longer easy to find in my territory. I would think about why, I would name it, I would understand it, and then I would engage in more international diplomacy with the Dane and ask them for spruce gum. Maybe I'd trade them some maple syrup for Manoman. I would then need 10 days to build the canoe, which would mean boring an elder's front yard on the reserve and bringing in more like-minded Anishinaabek to help me. Eventually, I would discover that I needed paddles. So I'd have to start this process over again, finding somebody with that knowledge, harvesting materials, and building the paddles. I would then need goodness knows how long to learn how to drive that thing. Next, I would ask the elder whose lawn I'm borrowing to build the canoe how to get there. He would tell me, a sin sagi gun, a tick mix sagi gun, gichigaming, odanabe, himrash koreyan, sakateachuan, chinabish. He would tell me where I need to put the offerings. Then he would tell me to paddle along the shore of China Beach or Lake Ontario until you see the mist from Niagara Falls <coughs> and then paddle across the lake. He would add, I don't know if you can still see the mist through the smog of Toronto. And I'm not sure if climate change has screwed up the currents and the roots and nobody crosses the lake in the birch bark canoe anymore, so good luck. <laughs> After that, he says he doesn't know the route, so he tells me I need to ask the Nautilus the Mohawks, or whomever territory I end up in, could be Seneca, Cayuga, Odenaida, Onondaga, Tuscarora even, or ask those Cree that drove that big canoe to New York City to protest the hydroelectric dams, he suggests. More international diplomacy, more ceremony. Then I do my own research and I would check in with the Hawaiians because they have built a boat, a seafaring vessel called the Hakalea, and they have um, retraced a lot of their, uh, their ancient 
travel routes in the ocean. And the first thing those Hawaiians would tell me is, you don't get anywhere with your canoe tied to the dock. Then I would do more research because I am an academic. <laughs> and I would ask those, those jaganash, those white canoeists, since white people have wrecked the travel routes anyway, they might know how to get um, through the locks and through the uh, waterways that changed. I asked my mom about food. She tells me in a very confident terms that I need to take one bushel of apples and an ultraviolet pen so I can drink the water. She's going to make this into a, a fitness expedition as well. <laughs> Her answers remind me of Natabush, who made a similar journey in a canoe at the beginning of time. I remember I am merely reenacting something that they did and something that generations of my ancestors have done before me, and I'm gifting those yet to be born with my own likely hilarious reenactment of this. I remember that Natabush's ordeal journey was a struggle. It was not easy. There was lots and lots of failures. He relied upon countless beings for help, and he almost didn't make it. They almost didn't make it. But also, that this was their methodology for learning about their ethical responsibilities about how to live in the world the way Manado had placed them in. Let's say there is some sort of Anishinaabe miracle, and I find myself on the Hudson's River, and I make it here. In my ongoing conversation with my ancestors, and I'm going to call her Mindamoya, which is our word for old woman, and it, it means really the one who holds it all together, she wants to know why. Why am I going to Rutgers? Why am I going to Princeton? Why was putting all this effort, likely for two years, with nine different indigenous nations, countless different plant and animal nations, not to mention the 730 days of irritating conversations with her? Mindamoya says, what do you have to say, Leanne, that is so important that you spent two years of effort and nine, in different, nine <laughs> different indigenous nations, countless different plant and animal nations, not to mention the 370, 730 days of conversations? I think, well, I want to visit with the Lenape. Mindamoya says, which ones? I think the academic one. <laughs> Minda Moya says, well, where is she? Well, she isn't here. Well, why not, Minda Moya says. Well, I don't know, dispossession, displacement. She teaches in San Francisco. Maybe the organizers of Princeton didn't think to invite her. Maybe they didn't, she couldn't come. Spring is an exceptionally busy time for people at the university. Minda Moya says, I bet. <laughs> The upside of all of this for me is that had I come here using that methodology, I would have learned a tremendous amount of Anishinaabe theory, ethics, practice, and skill. I would have built friendships and a network of international relationships. I would have learned things from the land, an urbanized, polluted, not even close to pristine land, knowledge that I cannot predict or propose. And in terms of my own research and artistic practice, I would have planted the seeds which would likely have driven my process for years to come. Even if I never made it here, the process would have been insanely generated. I would have come out, even crashed on the shore of Lake Ontario in my substandard birch bark canoe, more collected to the, to the land and to the nations I share the world with. I would have built an imperfect, probably kind of crappy Anishinaabe world and then I would have lived in it. That's resurgence. Me telling you about it is not. So I skipped the two-year process of building a canoe, and I traveled here by riding in a metal tube 30,000 feet above the earth. And the Lenape scholar whose territory I'm in, the brilliant Joanne Barker, isn't on the agenda at the conference, and that's not a dig at the organizers because I know how difficult organizing events is, and Chief Dwayne Perry will be there. But luckily, Dr. Barker created a remarkable collection called Critical Sovereignty, Indigenous Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies, and the book <coughs> starts with this gorgeous Lenape story. A woman returned from the field to find a curious hole in the ground outside her lodging. She looked inside the hole, deep into the earth, and someone spoke to her from there. 
The woman asked who it was. If anyone wishes to hear stories, let them come and roll a little tobacco or a bead, and I will tell them a story. So the people came with tobacco and beads, and many stories were told. We do not know whether the stories are true, but we do know that they tell us who we are. And they all began with a giving of thanks. Wanishi, miigwech, nawin, masicho, mahalo. We don't know whether the stories are true, only that they tell us who they are. Mizamoya says, that's great, Leanne. You quoted something Dr. Barker might have said if she were here now. And now, Dr. Rickshot, what are you going to share back? Well, I don't know what's appropriate. Minda Moya says, tell a story, maybe something from March or April. Leanne says, I've already told that one maybe too many times. Actually, they'll think I'm a one trick pony. Minda Moya says, do they get the story yet? Do you? Leanne says, history would tell us that I probably do not. <laughs> Mindemoya says, then tell it again and do a better job this time. I first learned this story from Doug Williams from Curve Lake about 20 years ago. In my retelling today, the main character's name is Badabin. Badabin is that first light of dawn before the sun, before the sun rises. The first part of the word, and I learned this from Susan Blight, who's an Anishinaabe scholar in Toronto. She learned it from Alex McKay, who is a, a language teacher at the University of Toronto, from KI. And he splits the word into three parts. That first part, the first prefix, um, means the future is coming at you. That's what be means. Da means your home or the present. And ba or ban is a suffix that we would put on the end of somebody's name after they have passed on. So it's that past tense. So bedaven, that first light of dawn that happens every single day, is a collapsing of the past and the future in on the present. It's what we have. So bedaven is out walking in the bush one day. It's Zigwan, that first part of spring. The lake is opening up. The snow is finally melting. They are feeling that first warmth of spring on their cheeks. Nikichinandan, they are thinking, I am happy. Then that Badavan goes out walking, collecting firewood for their dodong, decides to sit under the maple tree, maybe stretch out, maybe have a little rest maybe collect firewood a little later. Oh, I'm feeling happy today, says that Badabin. And while that Badabin is lying down and looking up, they see a squirrel up in the tree. Bonjour, Jidamo. I hope you had a good winter. I hope you had enough food cached. But Jidamo doesn't look up because she's already busy. She's not collecting nuts, going. She's not building her nest. Gawin, not yet. She's not looking after anyone young. Gawin, it's too early. She's just nibbling on the bark and then doing some sucking. Nibble, nibble, suck. Bedavin is feeling a little curious, so they do that too on one of the low branches. Nibble, nibble, suck. Mmm, this stuff tastes good. It's real sweet water. Mmm. Then Bedavin gets thinking and they make a quick little hole in that tree and they make a slide for that sweet water to run down. They make a container out of birch bark and they collect that sweet water and they take that sweet water home and they show their mama. And that Dodom is excited and they have 300 questions. Ah, Bedavin, what is this? Where did you find it? Which tree? Who taught you how to make it? Did you put sema? Did you say miigwech? How fast is it dripping? Does it happen all day? Does it happen all night? Where's the firewood? Bedavin tells their dodom the story and she believes every word because they are her Bedavin and they love each other very much. Let's cook the meat in it tonight. It will be lovely sweet. Nahal. Nahal. So they cooked that meat in that sweet water and it was lovely sweet, it was extra lovely sweet, it was sweeter than just sweet water. The next day, 
Bedaven takes their mama to that tree, and their mama brings Kukum, and Kukum brings all the aunties, and there's a very big crowd of Michisa, Gikinishnabe, Koyuk, and there's a very big lot of pressure. And Bedaven tells about a jinnimal, and Bedaven does the nibble nibble suck part, and at first there are technical difficulties, and none of it works. But mama rubs Bedaven's back, she tells Bedaven that she believes them anyway, and they talk about lots of variables, like heat and temperature and time. And then Jesus, the sun, comes out and warms everything up, and soon it's drip, drip, drip. Those aunties go crazy. Sasakoya, they're dancing around, hugging a bit too tight, kicking and high-fiving until they take it back home and boil it up and boil it down into sweet, sweet sugar. Ever since, Every zigwan, those machisa geek in Ishnabetwewa collect that sweet water and boil it up and boil it down into that sweet, sweet sugar. All thanks to Bedaven and their lovely discovery, and to the squirrel and her precious teaching, and to those maple trees and their boundless sharing. Bedaven is a concept, a theory, and a philosophy. Bedaven is a living person with a spirit, and actually several living people carry this name in my nation. And that event happens every single day in almost all parts of the world. So to learn from Bedaven, one needs to get up every morning at dawn and witness, a practice that my ancestors did every day. This is a simple land-based practice. You can do it nearly everywhere on earth. You need zero supplies. It costs nothing. It's fairly accessible. Badabin, the process that fuels all of life on Earth, including the water cycle. Badabin, the beginning of an interaction between fire and water. Badabin, the one who shows us how to be. Badabin gets up every single day and is present, no matter what. It is never about Badabin. Badaven is an incredible act of humility. It is always about getting the light and the heat and life to the earth. In this particular Badaven story, there is kindness, there is land, there are elders and children and adults and plants and animals and water and more land, air, ancestors, those yet to be born, heat and light. There is consent and the process of consensus. There is individual and collective self-determination. There is sharing knowledge across borders from the Squirrel Nation to the Anishinaabeg. There is a normalization and a centering of queerness that is inclusive of the cis straight aspects of community. There is an absence of surveillance. No one gave Badaven a mark on their new learning. And there is success because there is more connection. Like me in my theoretical canoe, Bedaven would have been successful whether or not they made maple sugar, whether or not they even met the squirrel, because at the end of the day, they were more connected to the beings they shared their world with than before. This story happens every morning, and this story happens every year when the Anishinaabe return to the sugar bush. This hub of intelligent Anishinaabeg relationality may be threatened by land theft, environmental contamination, the legacy of residential schools and state-run education, <coughs> colonial gender violence, climate change, but Badaven is there anyway, making maple sugar as they have always done in a loving, compassionate reality, propelling us to recreate the circumstances within which this story and Anishinaabe takes place, propelling us to rebel against the permanence of settler colonial reality and not just dream alternatives, but collectively and continually create them on the ground in the physical world in spite of being occupied. What if Bedaven had had no access to the sugar bush because of land dispossession, industrial contamination, or global climate change? What if they were too depressed or anxiety-ridden from being erased from Canadian society, removed from their language and homeland, targeted as a squaw or a slut or a drunken Indian, or just too sad from being bullied for not fitting into the colonial gender binary? What if the trauma and pain of ongoing colonial gender violence made it impossible for their mama to believe them or for their mama to reach out and so gently rub their lower back at that critical point? 
What if that same trauma and pain prevented their aunties and elders from gathering around them and supporting them when there were technical difficulties? What if settler colonial parenting strategies positioned the child as less believable than an adult? What if Bidabin had been in a desk at school that didn't honor at its core their potential within Machisagi Kanishnabek intelligence? Or what if they'd been in an educational context where having an open heart was a liability instead of a gift? What if they hadn't been on the land at all? What if Badabin lived in a world where no one listens to two-spirit children, or girls, or children? What if Badabin had been missing or murdered before they ever made it out to the sugar bush? And what if we were working to collectively create the conditions where we would produce and support thousands and thousands and thousands of Badabins? Miigwech. But you, you, you say 
He writes a book every tweet, Facebook post, blog post, Instagram photo, YouTube video, and email we sent during the I Don't Know More campaign made the largest corporations in the world corporations controlled by white men with vested interests in settler colonialism, more money to reinforce settler colonialism. And of course, I mean, as, as all of you have heard from listening um, to Leanne, you are, in, you're, 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 it's impossible to, to separate the land from everything you do. And you also have a critique of the disembodied nature of, of, of what it means for so much organizing to happen in these hypermediated spaces. So where are you with this now? I noticed you're off Twitter. I'm off social media. <laughs> um, well, I think it's really important for movements to think these things through. And that would be, um, that would, and, and right now, I think when I was writing this book, I thought that this was a really important conversation for the indigenous community to have. Because while there had been some, some very visible benefits to organizing this way, there were some very real drawbacks. And I started to think about how my ancestors would have organized, and um, they would have they would have traveled, they would have met face to face, they would have shared food, they would have shared stories, they would have shared ceremonies, they would have spent a lot of time together, which is not that different to how we were organizing pre-internet building relationships, thinking strategically, building the organizational structure, building a, a system of communication that was not under surveillance. And all of these types of things, the indigenous uh, organizing community, a lot of us haven't had enough time um, because we're continually reacting to whatever the issue is of the day. So I sort of wanted to take a step back and I wanted to think this through in terms of of um, building better movements and organizing more effectively. And so I think that you can't, I think the internet and social media can't replace those face-to-face -face relationships. They can't replace that trust building. Um, I think it's important for us to collectively to think through um, the surveillance aspect, to collectively think through what happens when the world is witnessing our uh, are the worst versions of ourselves in Twitter fights. Um, when we're discussing the movement on Facebook openly as if we are in a, a closed room and no one's listening, um, I think we need to be smarter about our use of technology. And while I think some of the benefits in Animal War was we got a lot of people um, mobilized very quickly to particular spots in the, in the real world, when the state started to push back, the movement fell apart pretty pretty quickly because we hadn't developed those relationships of trust because we couldn't give each other the benefit of the doubt because we had no kind of centralized communication or strategic organizing um, body uh, because we didn't even have mechanisms to communicate with each other because we didn't even know each other, a lot of us. So I think that, um, I think that the state didn't have to do very much to bring us down because we brought ourselves down because with the littlest bit of pushback, we couldn't, we, our, our movement, we hadn't done the, the movement building necessary to sustain um, ourselves through that. So that was one of the big things that I, that I noticed. Um, in terms of, of social media and blogging, that was the first time I think that we've been able to, to that degree, to be able to articulate what was happening for us politically, directly to Canadians and directly to the world. Normally we would have to go through the corporate media. So developing our own platforms and being able to influence the way that um, the media was talking about us as activists was something that I think was, was successful. Um, and a really big benefit of using that, that social media. And you can still see the benefits of that uh, in terms of the number of young emerging indigenous writers and musicians and artists that are, are getting recognition and audiences in Canada. Um, I think in terms of the political movement, it was very easy for I Don't Know More, um, once it started to collapse internally, to turn into the better vote for the liberals because it's better than, than the alternative. And we're sort of four years into that disaster and people are, there was a time though that, that there wasn't, um, people weren't even open to hearing kind of elusive criticism around what that might bring, what Trudeau might bring. So there's still 
not really. They're still not, they're still not. In the US, they're still not really, right? Yeah. You know, like, they, yeah. there's still a lot of like, you know, this is Trump's America. They don't want to hear that the guy with the raven <coughs> tattooed on his bicep isn't a really good guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're here to dispel that. The artist asked him to take the raven off his bicep. <laughs> um, so, it does it also impact the kind of issues that get privileged, right? Because, I mean, you've also written about the fact that that there's a lot of sort of space and appetite for representational debates around appropriation, around um, racist mascots, which is, and not to say that those aren't important debates, but the the debate underneath all the other ones, which is about land, um, doesn't get nearly as much ox oxygen in these forums. Exactly. So debates around representation, there's been a, a conflict over the last week on social media and now the real media between Inuit uh, throat singers and a, a Cree singer who has appropri appropriated the, the throat singing. That has got the kind of media traction that one would dream of when you're organizing. So the media loves conflicts between indigenous people. It loves victim stories. Um, it loves residential school survivors and, and sort of bringing out that kind of uh, trauma porn. Um, identity issues. Um, as an old person, you'll remember in the 90s, we already, we already dealt with that, but that's take, that takes up a lot of space in our in, in indigenous organizing or the issues that are, are, are um, front and center. Meanwhile, the, the earth is literally melting. So the, the story this week in Canada was that Canada is warming at twice the, the global rate, and that story was eclipsed so quickly by uh, these, these other kinds of issues. So let, let's talk a little bit about, about climate. Um, and it, you know, the, the, the story that you ended on, that incredibly beautiful story, it, I, I can't you know, help thinking about the way that climate disruption is disrupting maple syrup production in your territory. Um, and I think that when you have you know, settler cultures that are not land-based, I and mean, look, we're all land-based, right? Like whether we know it or not, <laughs> we are all dependent on natural systems. Um, we, there are people who are in denial about that um, because it seems like everything's fine when you turn on the tap or when you go to the grocery store. Um, but when there is a disruption, as people remember with Superstorm Sandy or you know, massive Electricity outage um, you know, that knocks out the entire, you know, the eastern seaboard. You, you realize pretty quickly that we're all pretty dependent on land. Um, but, but the, you know, what what does it mean to, um, you know, to be in a struggle to to have land rights respected? when the land itself is changing so fundamentally that all of these practices that are so central to culture and identity are, 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 are changing ways that can make, can make the land unrecognizable. And one of the things that I really learned from, from you, Leanne, is this, is this you know, I think sometimes when we think about nature, we have a picture in our minds of, of this sort of pristine nature, of, of wilderness, somewhere else, right? And so that, you know, a state like New Jersey, which has a huge amount of industrialization and, and the water is really polluted, it's easy to think that like nature is somewhere else, right? Um, and and I think you, you really pushed me to sort of um, to, to get away from this mindset that you have to go somewhere else <laughs> to experience nature. And that and you said you said to me a long time ago, you know, if your if your mother is sick, it doesn't mean you stop visiting her, it means you visit her even more. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what, 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 how climate change impacts the, the, the land rights struggle? My 13-year-old daughter, Minnewewe Dinesh, asked me that exact question last week when she was saying, like, why are you, why are you doing the work that you're doing when we're in so much trouble 
in terms of climate change? Shouldn't you be just mobilized on that? And uh, it took me aback because I think that um, there's truth in what she was saying. Um, I was telling uh, Naomi on the way here that this is the first year that um, our elders can remember where this app has essentially not run this year because it's been too cold. It's still too cold. So we're six weeks into the season. We would normally be done by now and it hasn't, hasn't really started. And I think what's going to happen is that it's going to warm up too quickly and we'll miss the window. So that's something that's um, devastating. Another thing that's devastating is that in my travels, speaking to groups and people like this, I will often get asked, you know, what, what can I do to help you guys? And my answer has been, you can mobilize and organize around climate change, and the audience always laughs. And it's not funny, <laughs> I'm not joking. I think that that is something that, um, that would actually help indigenous people because the land rights conversation doesn't make sense if there's no earth. Um, it also, I think, is very, I find it very depressing to see kind of the lack of mobilization, the lack of global mobilization around climate change, um, because I know that if um, the land, indigenous land rights movements are going to be successful, then we're going to have to mobilize <coughs> great numbers of people that are not indigenous. And if we can't mobilize great numbers of people around something that's directly impacting everybody, then the lead to indigenous rights seems, seems too big. So um, I think that uh, I try to place this also sort of in a context where we've seen in my territory, climate change has been an issue now for 400 years. We've been talking about these impacts of, of colonialism, of capitalism, of living in a very particular way. Um, for, for centuries, and we, we haven't got anywhere, except we know that the way to survive is to be present, and to be naming it, and to be organizing, and continuing to build the alternative. And I think that was the main message in, in what I wanted to share today, is getting up and building that alternative, even if it seems hopeless, even if you don't know exactly how, even if your canoe is going to sink, you get up and you try it again and again and again and again because that process generates the knowledge and the theory and the philosophy and the ethics that is going to collectively, eventually, help you get it right. You know, it's interesting too, like, we, we also never, you know, we never know when, like, what, what the impacts of our actions are going to be and what like a, a struggle like the um, struggle against the Dakota Access Pipeline and Standing Rock, right? That was a that was a fight against the pipeline, and it was at first successful and then rolled back under Trump. But it the, the impacts of it rippled outwards and are still rippling outwards, right? And one of the things that we know about Standing Rock is that, according to Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. You know, she at the time was working as a bartender. She took a few days off, went to Standing Rock, and decided while she was there to run for office, right? And that has shaken up American politics more than maybe anything else in, you know, a very long time. And, you know, she's introduced this, this um, resolution for a Green New Deal. Now, there are critiques of it, and, and I think if we had time, I'd want to dig into those with you. Um, but it shows that the impacts aren't always linear, right? Um, but also the, the kinds of, um, the, 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 the worldview that you are part of this chain of keeping alive, right, is about another way to live in the world, which to me is intimately connected to what the alternative is to the economic model that produces climate change, right? So it just depends on, so that's what I would say to your doctor. <laughs> say you are, you are fighting climate change. Um, you know, just simply by um, by being part of this process of, of keeping that world alive. And I remember being at a 
a conference organized by the late Arthur Emanuel about indigenous knowledge and climate change, where all the elders in the room were sort of in a desperate state about how do we get non-indigenous people to understand what we know while there's still time, right? Um, and I don't, I don't know what the answer to that is, but it's interesting to me that, you know, just about the Green New Deal, there's some really good language about protecting indigenous rights and, and, and free prior and informed consent for projects. But I don't think there's enough about indigenous knowledge in it, about, about indigenous real leadership. In and I'm wondering what you, it, it, what you think about that. Is, is there a, a response to climate change, a collective response to climate change that you can imagine where this, this knowledge is playing this kind of leadership role about what comes next and how we, um, you know, how we, you know, there's, we know that we need to draw down carbon very quickly. Um, we need to plant huge numbers of trees. We need to um, we need to do all kinds of ecological restoration if we're going to going to keep temperatures below 1.5. But there are different ways of doing that, right? There are ways that are really um, you know going to be trampling indigenous rights. There are ways that say you know we're going to just leave it to the engineers. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts on that? My my thoughts are that it's sort of the longer that you wait, the bigger the panic and the bigger the urgency and the more you're going to trample. And the less you're going to be able to build another world and the more you're going to kind of replicate the same world. So I think for me, um, and I think, I think oftentimes the environmental community will be saying things like we need, you know, we need indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge holds, holds the way. When I think of Anishinaabe knowledge, I think that's that's true, but but not in the way maybe that everyone wants to hear. I think an Anishinaabe ethic about living is you, in terms of sustainable development, is you don't develop as much as you possibly can while um, respecting the, the sustainability or the caring capacity of a particular environment. It's the opposite. You think, what can I give up to promote life? And so that means lower standards of living. That means a different economic model. That means um, finding meaning in relationships and experiences instead of shopping. That means becoming makers and producers instead of consumers. So that's not an easy, that's not a big secret message. It's, sounds simplistic, and then when you start to think about it, it's incredibly complex. And when you try to collectivize that, it's incredibly complex. But that's those are the sorts of conversations that I think that indigenous knowledge can propel us to have. But it's it's not we don't have quick fixes. And the longer that you wait, the less applicable I think our knowledge is going to be. Because as Naomi said, you know. I heard Art Manuel saying similar things 20, 20 years ago. You know, the Inuit elders have been warning us about this since the late 1970s. And in essence, all of our elders have been warning about capitalism and this, this way of, of living that's based on extraction and exploitation um, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so we, as we continue to ignore that, I think we're, we're losing um, the richness and the intelligence and the generative capacity of indigenous knowledge to, to build these other worlds. I also think um, what you, you were talking at one point about, about relationships really being the currency um, in the Shemitic tradition, not stockpiling, not hoarding, right? That during difficult times, it's the richness and the depth of your relationships that carry you through. And it strikes me so much, you know, we have these debates about the Green New Deal and, and everything. It's just, it's just maddening. I mean, people say, like, what is healthcare doing in there? What does that have to do with climate change? And it's like, look, things are going to get really, really tough. So it really begs this question of, are you going to take care of each other? Are, you, are we going to be decent to each other? Um, because if not, then it looks really, really scary, right? It looks like Katrina. It looks like 
Puerto Rico, and where you see exactly what Leanne was talking about, that the, that the communities where relationships were strongest are the ones that, 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 that survived, that were able to come together, cook food, um, you know, that were, that were able to, to, to problem solve when FEMA didn't show up, right? Um, so the idea that you can kind of pry climate change apart from these fundamental questions of, do we believe that every human life is of equal value? Do we, are we gonna take care of each other in the most basic ways? It's all connected, it's about relationships. So that's a, a, huge, a huge take home for me. I wanted to ask you uh, about elders. This is something else, you know, you always center elders in everything that you write. Um, and, and the knowledge that you have been handed down over your life. And this strikes me as another problem we have. I read an article recently in the New York Times about young millennials feeling that they are no longer of any use to the economy <laughs> because they, you know, it's already, it's already moved on and they you know, have, haven't even hit 30. Um, so this sort of the speed with which we're throwing people away seems to be accelerating. Have you noticed this? Yeah, I think I read the, the same article and also thought, um, come millennials, come. <laughs> come and we'll build a different economy um, where you don't feel like you've been, been thrown away. Um, I feel like um, I, I do center elders in a lot of my work um, because of that expertise they have in terms of making and in terms of um, carrying that, that knowledge that doesn't exist on, on the internet. Yeah. So my last question before we open it up, so get your questions ready, everyone. Um, it has to do with this, you know, the, I think in Western and European Christian, Judeo-Christian narratives, there's this apocalypse is always off in the distance, right? Um, and this is a lot of the way we talk about climate change. It's just like we have to act now in order to avert this breakdown, this collapse, this apocalypse that's always just around the bend, right? And I'm guilty of this myself, with that this idea that this is how we're gonna motivate people. We're gonna scare them about something off in the future, and then that will act, and as we see, it's not really working. And in your writing, you talk about an apocalypse that's already happened, or, and, it, and it's still underway a collapse that's underway. So if, if we understand that the collapse ha has happened, that there are many apocalypses, um, and, and we are in the, in the wake of them, as Christina Sharp talks about, um, how does that change, how would that change us if that story was different? I think that, um, I think apocalypse overwhelms people. And I think when people are overwhelmed, when I'm overwhelmed, I shut down. And I become immobile. And then I can't push it away. And so for, I think for indigenous people, we have lived through, in my territory, lots of different apocalypses. Um, and we have the skills to survive those and to navigate through those. Um, we have, and the ethics and the systems of care and those relationships are the things that have brought us through those apocalypse. So I think, um, and I don't know, this is a very good question. I think it's something that we collectively need to be talking about is how to motivate people. When I think of how to motivate myself, I'm not often motivated through fear or through being overwhelmed or being critiqued. I'm often overwhelmed by inspiration, by enthusiasm, and being shown sort of the alternative rather than told. And so my idea of, of collecting and building these alternative systems, when I think of what inspires me, when I think of Lolina, when I think of um, these groups of people that are that are getting together and are and are coming up with with local solutions to particular problems um, as a result of climate change. I think that that's that makes me feel like I want to be part of something, and I think there might be something in that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So we have a mic here. Um, we have Joseph. Um, 
mentioning a mutual friend of ours named Melina and Massimo, who has been part of this amazing initiative bringing um, renewable energy to indigenous communities, including in the heart of the Alberta Tar Sands projects that are owned and controlled by indigenous people. Anybody? It's not even my students. Julia? <laughs> I think we need to have the mic because they're filming. Do you mind? Oh, no. Yeah. Can I bring my notebook? Thank you for coming here today. Um, I wanted to talk about more like the economics about this because I'm very interested in what your perspective is. Really because of the immediacy of climate change and what we need to do quickly and now for action, um, do you think capitalism can be used as a vehicle to solve it? Do we have enough time to set up another economic system to sort of save our planet or do we have to use what we have? This is an easy, easy question. Sorry. <laughs> like, somebody else has to answer this question other than me. <laughs> um, I don't think that it's an either or question. I think that we need to be doing both. And so I think we need to be doing everything that we can be doing right now um, to mitigate the worst parts of climate change. And the world is big, and there are lots of people, and there are lots of things that I'm not good at, and that is going to be one of them. But um, while, while people are mobilized and doing that, then there needs to be other people that are mobilizing and thinking through um, what the new world is going to look like when we're through the apocalypse. So I think in indigenous communities, you had visionaries, you had spiritual people, you had, um, you had a lot of people with a lot of different gifts, and you had societies that honored and supported and nurtured those different gifts and that diversity and that kind of self-determination. So you build up communities of people that have different skills that can, can use that. And I think that that kind of approach is what would be my suggestion. Can I just have a follow-up? Is that allowed? It's a small. Uh, do you have a utopic vision of what that world would be? Well, I feel like I've had a utopic like when we had utopia and colonialism and capitalism destroyed it. So um, I feel like a lot for a lot of us, it's it's taking um, pulling what our ancestors had and the way that they lived, um, pulling it out of the the um, the past, combining it with the reality of the present, and then giving birth to a different future. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, I thought it was really interesting when you were talking about um, the use of social media, and I had a question about. Uh, I guess the way that relationships um, would look like, and again, like a utopian sense, um, because I think the way that like the uh, relationships between peoples on this land hundreds of years ago were very uh, different than they look the way than they are now um, in terms of uh, one just the like population, but also I think. They are much more intimate, and communities are smaller, and people know each other directly. Um, I think there's like uh, I know that each person has like a certain capacity for the amount of relationships that they can sustain. So my question is, um, would like the kind of necessary relationships that you described before in order to create change um, be able to be sustained? by like the institutions that we have now, for reference, for instance, the university has thousands and thousands of students and faculty, or would it require like smaller, returning to like smaller communities? Mm 
Like, does that make sense? Yeah, I feel like when I was your age, the internet and social media didn't exist. Um, but yet, all of these institutions did exist. And so I, I would say that my political awakening was in the 1990s during the, the so-called Oak of Crisis, which you guys can Google and see Ellen Gabriel on TV, um, which was a very different experience than, than kids watching I Don't Know More Now because of social media. So I think that first I, said, I would say that I wouldn't historicize what I've shared as being in the past because I think indigenous people um, were in the present and the relationships that we have still exist. And so it's still, that world is still going alongside this world. I think your question is interesting and I think everybody's going to come up with a different answer. And I think as you move through your life, your ability to maintain healthy, meaningful, balanced, sustainable relationships changes. And it's something to keep track of. It's something to think about um, and how you're relating to people. And I think having children is one of the, the biggest teaching moments of my life because now you've got sort of a human dependent upon you and dependent upon your mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical health for their own well-being. And so I think it shrinks at some point where maybe there's only one or two relationships that you can be healthy and present in. Um, and then as those, as those responsibilities um, ease, there might be more. But I think, I think it's an interesting question for everybody to sort of think about their capacity um, and what, what kinds of social and collective organizing can we engage in to maintain and nurture those relationships. So something like, rather than all of us sitting at home at night eating popcorn, watching Netflix, and being on our phones, what if we started to get together and make food? Right? Like, that's not a big, it's not a big, overwhelming um, reorganization of everything. It's a small tweak. But what happens when we start to do those small tweaks, and what happens when we start to do them together? Can I just apologize for speaking? Oh, totally, that's totally fine. Anybody who doesn't feel like coming all the way to the front is welcome to shout out from the back. Um, should I come up or? It's up to you. Um, okay, um, in your opinion, what is the best or a realistic way to allocate resources um, fairly to a world that is growing so fast in population and has needs? And that's kind of a tough question. Again, I would take that, I would, I would think that through from an Anishinaabeg perspective um, in the context of my own life. What is the best way that I can redistribute the resources, the privileges, the opportunities, um, and the struggles within my immediate family, within my immediate community, and with the people that I'm accountable to? And I think collectively, if everyone does that, then at some point as you take those values and ethics and you scale them, you move them across scales, then collectively we will develop the systems of reorganization to, um, to support that and to amplify it across scales. That's, what, that's how Anishinaabe society works before. You, your relationship um, to the land and to, to Joy Manajo was sort of your first responsibility, then to your family, then to your clan, then to your community, then to your, to your nation. And those ethics and values and practices in your own life are the same things. They're, they're tweaked a little bit when you're moving them across scales because there's logistic issues. But those systems then are generated by the embodiment of those, those ethics and values. Complicated answer to complicated questions. <laughs> I have a question sort of related to that. Um, thinking about, so when you said you tell people to go organize um, in their communities when, to like produce the change that we need to do, um, what happens though when, as individuals, we're still sort of thinking through it, calm and capitalist mindset? 
how can we actually organize and produce an alternative change when we ourselves aren't um, economists, basically? Well, on one hand, we can't wait. I can't. I can't wait um, for everybody to be decolonized, right? Um, and even myself, I can't wait for myself to. Um, and I think the act of doing it and making mistakes is generative. I think um, the knowledge that you don't have enough knowledge, or you haven't done enough research, or you haven't developed those critical thinking skills, I think that that is an act of resistance in and of itself. So go educate yourself, which you guys are doing, um, and which I know is doing. Think through things by reading, by reading, by um, immersing yourself in this vast um, body of knowledge that we have around organizing and resisting and world building. Um, but don't be, don't be just confined by that. And I think in universities, there's um, there's a lot of opportunity to to get your your first chances at organizing on smaller issues and on issues of concern to to students and to this community. And so I think that that's a really good place. There's also people that have been doing this. Your elders. There's people that have been organizing for countless generations now. There's a big body of knowledge on how to resist this that you're a part of and that I'm a part of. And so accessing those those bodies and those people and those minds, um, I think that's a good thing to do too. I think it's such a good point that it is a real privilege to be in a university and to, to be face to face in rooms with peers and um, you know faculty and you know who are here to learn. Um, and so it, I think it, it, to waste that time on the phone, mediated, you know, not not creating face-to-face -face experiences and shared projects is it's never going to be easier than than this, where people are physically thrown together into rooms and on, you know into, into a campus. Um, but it is certainly harder for your generation than for ours because you have many more distractions, and I think more economic and social pressures around, you know using these tools to collect <coughs> currency um, then, and, and, and build, build your own brand that can then be monetized later on. I mean, they're real pressures. Last question. <laughs> so as an artist, do you think that the role of music and poetry as an act of resistance has changed in the age of surveillance capitalism and social <coughs> media, or is it the same as it's always been? I think there's definitely been some changes. I think for me, in my own practice, I, I, mean, I don't really, I don't necessarily see my music, my performance as an act of resistance. I see, or what I want to do through that practice is to affirm um, the indigenous people in my audience, the people of color in my audience, the black folks in my audience, um, and uplift them and inspire them and give them the fuel to continue on the resistance. I think in the age of surveillance, in the age of, of recognition, um, I think there's a lot of artists that think very strategically and very theoretically and aesthetically about intervening in those spaces, and there's a lot of artists that don't. Thank you all for coming. Um, I just want to do one last one plug for um, the record label that, uh, that, that the end is a part of, just building on that last question, which is called RPM, Revolutions Per Minute. Um, it's all indigenous uh, musicians, and they're, uh, in addition to the work, there's lots of just fantastic folks to discover. Um, and yeah, go ahead and join us tonight. Thank you so much, Leanne. <laughs>